Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is <coughs> John Williams. I'm the Dean of the Law School and I'll be uh, emceeing here tonight. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on the land of the Ghana people. The University of Adelaide's uh, three campuses uh, are on those lands and I'd like to acknowledge the great connection and culture that these people, our ancestors in many ways, bring to this nation. It's also a great pleasure for me to be involved in this lecture because of Mike Young. Uh, we have, I'm not sure the first time we met, but I suspect it was outside a minister's office as we were trying to argue whether or not water allocation in South Australia had been achieved and what, to the levels we needed. Um, I as a lawyer, he as an economist, I suspect the solution I had was a much blunter instrument than the one he was able to offer, but I enjoyed our time working together. Tonight's uh, lecture will go for about 40 minutes, uh, then there'll be an opportunity for questions. Um, there's a few housekeeping matters if the facilities are through this door. Uh, if the conversation becomes, come, becomes quite incendiary, the exits are to be found uh, at the back here. It's my great pleasure now to introduce the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Adelaide, Professor Warren Bebbington. Uh, I'll let uh, Professor Bebbington make his way slowly to the uh, to the front here to introduce uh, our guest for tonight. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, John. Harvard alumni, colleagues, guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the University of Adelaide and to this Harvard Chair lecture. The Harvard Chair was established by a gift from the Australian Government to Harvard in 1976 to commemorate the Australian Bicentennial. <clears throat> it's become one of Australia's most prestigious academic appointments. Its mission was to maintain such teaching, research and publication as will help to promote awareness and understanding of Australia in the United States of America. Since that time, Harvard has invited distinguished visiting scholars on an annual basis to hold a chair in Australian studies at Harvard. <clears throat> the holders of the chair present courses and seminars on topics related to Australia and its culture. The University of Adelaide is delighted that we've had two Harvard chairs in recent years. A professor of English and Creative Writing, Nicholas Jose, and tonight's speaker, Professor Mike Young. Another member of the university's community, graduate Professor Emerita Gillian Rowe, was also a Harvard Chair in Women's Studies in 1994-95. <clears throat> These Adelaide Scholars are now part of an impressive Harvard Chair alumni membership, which includes such luminaries as Manning Clark, Gough Whitlam and Geoffrey Blaney. In 2010, the Chair was renamed in recognition of the two Prime Ministers of Australia, Whitlam and Malcolm Fraser, from opposite sides of politics, who brought to fruition this important initiative. Through the University of Adelaide's Harvard Chairs, we're very pleased to have built a relationship with, uh, with Harvard itself. And it's customary that on returning from Harvard, the chair gives a public lecture hosted by their home faculty and related to the work done during their time at Harvard. And so to tonight's speaker and our most recent Harvard Chair, Professor Mike Young. Professor Young holds a research chair in environmental and water policy at the University of Adelaide. He was the founding executive director of the university's Environment Institute. He's a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia and a distinguished fellow of the Australian Agricultural and Resource Economics Society. He's best known for his contribution to the development of robust natural resources and environmental policies. In recent times, his research has focused on the use and design of market-based instruments with attention to water. He played a critical role in the consideration of water reform options for the Murray-Darling Basin. While internationally, he's known for his capacity to integrate biophysical and economic information to produce innovative policy proposals. In 2006, Professor Young was awarded Australia's Premier Water Research Prize, the Land and Water Australia Eureka Award for Water Research. This recognised the significant impact of his research with the late Jim McColl, uh, 
to the development of improved water entitlement, allocation and trading systems in Australia. Since then, he's continued to make a fundamental contribution to the evolution of water policy. He's also an honorary professor at University College London, and in 2012 spent several months in the UK working on water policy options for the British Department of Environment, <coughs> Food and Regional Affairs. As Harvard Chair, Professor Young spent, most, uh, spent the 2013-14 academic year at Harvard where he taught a course on transformational environmental policy reform and began <coughs> preparing a book on the same subject. The guidelines that emerge from his research suggest that more attention needs to be given to policy design and engagement. So tonight we're privileged to hear him speak on managing transformation change. What would a South Australian carbon trading system look like? Please join me in welcoming Professor Mike Young. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Thank you, everybody, for. Um, coming tonight and for the opportunity to talk to you all. Um, transformational change is something that's really interested me and inspired me as you think through ways to do what universities do, which is think, conceive about something that needs to be changed and made, made different. And the real challenge is then is to work out how to do it. And when I arrived in Harvard, I was invited to think about setting up some guidelines for transformational change. And I want to um, talk about that generally, but rather than give you a boring list of things to do, I thought, well, what is the transformational change that I would really like to see happen? And I think the one which the world is wrestling with is about the idea of climate change and how to deal with it, how to move to a low carbon economy. I can skip over um, the summary and description of the chair as the Vice Chancellor has already um, summarise the background of this chair with one thing that I do want to say and that is that when somebody is invited to take the, on the chair there are two responsibilities. The mandate which is given to someone in a chair is to take something that's uniquely Australian to Harvard. I think the really important thing is at the same time to bring something back and you don't take what you took over there and bring the same thing back. So today I'm going to have a go at bringing something back which is different to the things I took over but builds upon and learns from the opportunity that I had. In my appointment I sat down first and wrote a framework paper for how to take the Australian experience in water reform and apply it anywhere in the world. And as a result of that and thinking about transformational change, I was able to think long and hard about how you might bring about water reform in America. And I'm pleased to say that I'm now deeply in the process of transferring that information through. I think it's highly likely that the state of Nevada will be the first to go down a reform pathway that looks like an Australian reform program but doesn't make all the mistakes that we made. I don't want to spend time dwelling on that, but let me talk about transformational change and what it is. Transformational change involves fundamental shifts in strategy. It's when a government realises that things are not working, not working well, and the strategy that's being followed is not working and there has to be a different one. The example which is most common in the world that I work in as an economist, and in fact actually lots of lawyers now work in, is one where you start to think about using market-based processes to keep resource use within sustainable limits rather than the old approaches of regulate, control and freeze things. I've been noticing in America with a water reform that a lot of the water policies were really worked out in the 1930s and they're still locked in the 1930s. There's still farmers who are required to do exactly the same thing as they were doing in 1930, and they still are doing exactly the same thing because that's all they're allowed to do. Um, typically, a transformational change has far-reaching consequences for business investment, and I stress that because I think that's one of the things that 
we often forget about when we talk about the environment, that we're really trying to guide and shift investment. They change the way people behave and think about things, and they change the way resources are used. And when you think about that and think how change builds on change and cascades forward, you, have, you realise how hard it is. As a result, governments are very wary about going about anything that's transformational. Incremental change is much more common. Um, and arguably, business is much better at this than government. Um, I'd like to be able to say, say actually universities also are good at transformational change, but I think we find it really hard to change. Um, but when you do go about a transformational change, typically there are five phases that you go through. The first is when you conceive an idea, you test it and you develop the proposition. The work that Christine Esau and I have been actually doing, and Christine's helped me a lot in this, um, has identified a whole pile of guidelines. I don't want to go through them all today, but let me highlight some that I think are very important. Identifying the problem and contesting the need to solve this problem is very important. If you're going to go about a transformational change, there almost has to be a crisis. One of the people who's, who's contributing to the book that, that we're assembling says, never waste a crisis. But for a crisis not to be wasted, somebody has to have wor worked out the solution. You can't say a crisis, give me the answer and do something different. The detailed work has to be done. And that requires a focus on excellence in design of the solution. And particularly something which is forgotten about is the importance of, of promoting investment confidence, getting business seriously interested in making the change and understanding what's, what's there. And you also have to understand at the same time that the old way of doing things is going to be preferred by most people. There's huge reluctance to change. And finding mechanisms that enable change to start are very important. And when you look through the things that stand out, um, they stand out because they're simple and obvious and can be communicated well. There's a second stage of engagement and refinement <clears throat> where if a transformational change is going to be implemented, there has to be a simple message. And academics, I think, are very bad at putting together the simple message and communicating it having a, a dual discussion going, that detailed academic discussion, but also having a simple thing which can be on the front page of a newspaper is really important. As a simple example of that, when we were arguing about how to reform the Murray-Darling, we started to talk about the need for a small expertise-based board. And we did, by, did it by saying, there is a need for something like a reserve bank for water. And the public got that. What did it mean? It didn't matter. They just liked the way the Reserve Bank ran things in Australia and having someone who could run water as well as you could run the economy worked. It was a simple message and it was powerful. It's important when you're talking about a reform to get the winners to come out and say that this is going to be good. It's part of an Australian culture particularly where people who think they're going to win out of a reform keep quiet about it. They don't want to be seen to be out there saying, I'm going to be made better off by this. While the people who complain and don't like the changes will be very vocal. As part of that, you need to have entrepreneurs out there, people saying this is going to be really good for everybody. And finding ways to calm the potential losers and fears. And that's code and language for really doing something else that most people hate. And that's to grandfather in existing arrangements. If you look at successful water reforms, successful fishery reforms and policy reforms that are truly um, transformational, they normally involve people being minded in the early stages. If you're going to make a whole pile of businesses go bankrupt in the process, it's very rare for the change to happen and finding the conditions that are needed to get that transformational support in the community are also very important, and that gets back to the simple messages. Adoption of the legislation and agreement to implement is actually quite easy. If there is the support and if the work has been done early, then normally the reforms will sail through quite quickly. There'll be arguments in Parliament, 
but with the Australian systems that operate, normally that happens quite quickly. Implementation and particularly getting lock-in of a reform is much harder. You need, as a guiding rule, when you look through the transformational changes that have been successful around the world, to get some early gains, to have some winners out there, some demonstration that this is going to work. And that has to be very speedy. It has to be speedy there. The process has to be designed with the monitoring in place to allow the gains to be seen quickly. You need also to lock in key core elements of the um, system. It's a bit of an aside, but um, years ago I was working in kangaroo harvesting and I did the classic in terms of a transformational reform, got it all through, got it all through Parliament and everything, was all done. And then I went overseas. And I came back four years later having finished an assignment in Europe and America and went back to the industry and they said, Mike, it was just as well you went overseas. And I said, why? I said, oh, because it took us about three years to undo all the reforms that you did and if you'd been around, you wouldn't have let it happen. And it's true, policy entrepreneurs get involved in reforms. But as soon as the reforms implemented and goes through Parliament, they go off to do the next thing. And skilled people in industry then come in and undermine and hijack a lot of what's been done. Finding ways to lock in reforms so, so that the reversal can't happen is critically important in the design and often overlooked. The tricks that are common are to set up a new authority or a new structure which has an entity with staff that if you close down, you have to sack, you can't just move them easily. If they have a budget that's assigned to them, then it's important. In water, it was really interesting um, that in water reform, we established a new long-term asset, a water right. Once people started holding on to their new right, they became very possessive of it and didn't want to get rid of it. And that was very important in terms of driving the inertia forward. Australia fought for a long time over the detail, but nobody was saying we want to go back to the old regulatory system. And I think the secret to that was the fact that people had water rights that quickly became valuable and were rising in value and they wanted them to keep on rising in value. Um, and having a strategy to deal with the people who are going to try and oppose the reform and undermine it is very, very important, particularly at the political level but also in the investment business level. Putting all that together is important. The last thing I do want to mention because it comes from some of the case study work we've been doing. And the example comes from Andrew Campbell, who talks about land care. And Andrew was the father of land care in Australia, or one of the real three fathers of land care. Um, but the person responsible for really developing the arguments, getting the, the framework through, and implementing it. When he goes back now and looks at land care, he's embarrassed by what's happened because so much of it's fallen to bits. And when you talk to him about that and ask him what is the most important mistake that was made, he said probably the thing that killed Landcare more than anything else was the review criteria that were written. Ambitiously in legislation somebody wrote, and I guess he supported, the idea that Landcare was going to stop land degradation. If you're asking now what he should have said, he said it should have been to bring about a shift in the culture and the way Australian farmers think about it. And that was the goal, to build an awareness of the changes that had to occur and to build the institutions that would gradually and progressively over the next 20 or 30 years stop land degradation. But because they wrote in the words that said it's supposed to stop land degradation, the reviewers went back and checked whether or not land degradation had stopped. And it hadn't, so they said it's not working. Let me now turn with those few comments to climate change and the challenges that are here. If you look internationally, globally, there's increasing consensus of the need to limit global warming to about two degrees rise in temperature. If you look at what that means for Australia and model it through in terms of a fair share it means that we have to achieve near zero emissions for the, for the de generation of electricity by about 2050. There's essentially no other way to do it. That might sound like a huge change, and it is a huge change. But um, 
South Australia is well endowed to make that shift to a low carbon economy. And all the work that's been done, all the modelling says that it can be done in a way that's very affordable and could in fact make us still a global leader or hold us as a global leader. Um, at the moment, Australia is using expensive subsidies and grants and regulations. We started a few years ago with a carbon tax, abandoned that. We were planning to go to an emissions trading scheme. The idea I want to talk to you about today is that we could well end up with an emissions trading scheme. And if we did, and you take the best knowledge that's around in the world and design one, what would it look like? And the insight I want to bring to you is that rather than looking at all the other emissions trading schemes around the world, you might look to other natural resources, particularly water and fisheries and look at the experience that I've been lucky to explore in Harvard around transformational change. When you put the two together, some new structures come out which are quite interesting. For those of you who are interested in thinking about South Australia, this is a chart showing the emissions state by state of greenhouse gases. South Australia is very small in terms of overall emissions across all of Australia. It's about 5% of total emissions. That means that if we just sit back and let the rest of Australia design an emissions trading scheme, we might end up in a mess because we're small. There is an opportunity that often emerges out of the idea that you test and demonstrate in small areas that South Australia could go first. And if it did, then what would it look like? When we look at fisheries and water management, you find a couple of things that stand out and apply globally almost everywhere where there's been success, particularly Australia and New Zealand, parts of America, Canada, um, where we've gone to new market-based systems. There's a statutory plan which is approved by Parliament and um, is reviewed periodically and relies on the best available science. You don't get involved in politics trying to argue it. You get out of that and work out the best science around it. There's been a shift increasingly away from having big boards to, towards small expertise or school-based boards. It's interesting, if you look at the business literature and the business community, particularly is very influential at Harvard, they point out that if you want to have good decision-making, you have a small board. And the research that's done that says that every person you add after 7%, after seven members, decreases the quality of decision-making by about 20%. And you can argue over how you measure quality of decision-making, but it's a very important point. If you have a big board, it's socially acceptable for people to go out and say, I tried and I couldn't get my viewpoint, we didn't have time, so I'm sorry, it's a bad policy. If you have five people on a board, the only option if you don't like the decision that's made publicly, which is socially acceptable, is to resign. So you get tight ownership and that really builds investment confidence and trust in the whole system. And it builds the courage to drive things through because there's a strong sense of ownership. I can't stress how important that is and it's why you find um, things like reserve banks and federal reserves are, are experts and none of them ever go outside and criticise or even talk about what's decided inside. They know the importance of having complete trust in the quality of all their decisions they make. Existing users are normally grandfathered into the system. In fisheries and water, this is not too much of a problem. In climate change, it's a massive barrier. People hate the idea that polluters might be allowed to continue to pollute. And so they're opposed to thinking around this fundamental idea that perhaps you might have to grandfather people in. And grandfathering is letting people start with a property right that resembles roughly what they're allowed to do. How you put that together, we can talk about. In fisheries and in water management, there's a concept called unbundling, where you take what used to be a short-term licence, a right or permit, and you turn part of it into a long-term share and you issue those shares in perpetuity. And you set up registers so that the value of those shares can be used to finance activities and to be mortgaged. And South Australia invented the Torrens title system for land 
and that's now used in, in registries for water and actually fisheries rights and other rights. You'd expect a state-of-the-art system in terms of climate change to go down the same sort of pathway. The allocations or permits that are made are tradable separately and are bankable. If you don't want to use water, you can carry it forward to next year. If you don't want to emit carbon, why not have a framework where you can save the emission right for next year? So it's to the benefit to the environment, to everybody else, particularly if the government is pulling the emission limits down too fast, then it might make sense to have a market mechanism that avoids it. These are all fairly obvious things. If you think through the outcomes where we've done this in fisheries and water, share trading catalyses efficient investment and innovation. I stress the innovation. When Australia went, and this was highly contested at the time, to water rights that used to be five, seven, ten-year rights, to rights in perpetuity, businesses from all over the world flocked to Australia because suddenly they knew what the rules of the game were and they could see with confidence where things were going. The allocation trading, the amount of water you can use any, at any point in time, is traded separately. So there's two markets rather than one. If you look around the world, virtually all emissions trading schemes that involve permits for greenhouse gas only have one market. In fact, I can't find a single one that has a market for something like a share. And the use approvals that are put in place ensure compliance. And if you do grandfather, as we did in fisheries and in water management, you replace pressure, the pain associated with taxes and fear about what's going to happen, simply with opportunity. If you want to save, you can, and you save and you spend or sell the surplus to somebody else. But if you want to keep on doing what you were doing, you don't have to do anything. And what happens is gradually the values operate and change and shift and people start moving. And that's what we've seen around the world. We've seen rapid, very fast innovation and lots of investment. And when we look at the emissions trading schemes, when I look at the emissions trading schemes, none of this is happening. It's fear, it's reluctance. If you think through and now think about how you might do something in Australia, and I think you can see where I'm going, the moment we have created massive uncertainty. There are high cross subsidy programs in place. There's no bottom up innovation. If somebody has a good idea, it's really hard to invest in it. It's scary to invest in it because you don't know if the regime you're dancing to at the moment is still going to be in place or if there's going to be in another election, another shift in policy. If we're going to move to near zero emissions, we're going to need to maximise opportunities for actually polluters to adjust. The traditional policy challenge is talked about in terms of setting a limit. People don't agree, argue over that, I agree. Putting a price on emissions is equally important. But the third bit, which is, I think has tangled the world up, is government desire to make money out of controlling carbon introducing a tax or selling permits. And so they sometimes talk about starting with an emissions trading scheme and grandfathering people in the early stages, but they want to get back to selling permits and creating the revenue. That's a real barrier because business loses the incentive it starts off with. If you look in Australia at what's been happening, in the short term, it looks okay. We've turned the growth in emissions around to something that's now close to stable. But we still, if we're serious about going to getting down to two degrees warming as the maximum happens, in the next 30 years we have to get all this red stuff down to zero emissions, near zero. If you put a, a robust emissions trading scheme in place, what would it look like? The first one would be to set a plan or use a statutory plan to set the limits and the pathways that are going to be used. You'd put something, some sort of independent board in charge to work out and implement the details. You'd take the politics out of it. Getting this right is too important to be having people grandstanding in politics. You use the, the political system to set the principles and framework and the objectives and then let somebody independent run it on a day-to-day -day basis. You would expect tradable climate shares 
and you'd get some of these shares held by government and some by industry, and you'd make the permits tradable. But what's missing? The bit that's missing from here is the revenue for government. And this is really what the world's struggling with. And is there a way through what are put up as a standard design that can keep governments and communities happy? I think there is. And there are a couple of examples around this in fisheries and forestry systems, not in water systems, but in fisheries and forestry systems. I think it's really interesting. And the basic idea is something that's variously called a return to the community or something like that. And the idea is that rather than selling permits, you take everybody's shareholding and you take a small percentage, about 1% or 2% of their shares, and you auction them. And the government keeps the revenue from doing that. And this is just like land. If you have a Crown land lease or any asset, the rate of return in real terms is about 2% per annum. It's very hard to get past that. And if a community gets that back and if a government gets that back, then essentially it's renting the pollution opportunity to somebody else. Losing, however, 2% a year from something, something like actually greenhouse gas rights is not a big pain in the short term. But it's very valuable. If you think through the value of the carbon tax in perpetuity, it's worth a lot of money. And I think there's a big opportunity to add this in so that rather than selling the permits, you essentially tax the value of the shares. It's a very simple idea, and it builds in the third element, which is important. You've got the incentives for investment. You can then afford to grandfather people in, grandfather in the most dirty polluters, because the people who are the most dirty polluters in an economy are the ones that need the greatest incentive to change. And what better mechanism to put in place but one which says, here's a big incentive in the short term, but if you keep on polluting, it's going, to, it's going to cost you a lot in the future. But if you solve it quickly, you can make a lot of money because you can then sell that opportunity onto others. And putting those two together, I think, is a really interesting opportunity. And I'd be thrilled if Australia, or even, even more preferably as I'm going to end up in this talk, South Australia led the way in developing such a system. And to going back to the importance of lock-in and how do you get things to really lock in, I'd suggest that the, the actually revenue from a community return would be a third would go to federal government, a third to state government, and a third to local government. So this becomes part of the core funding system at all levels of government. So all members from the federal state to the local government all see the importance of dealing with climate change is something which will bring revenue into them. So they'll be interested and keen to maintain it and will be interested if they pull the limit down faster to see the value of shares go up and therefore their revenue to return. Getting that balance right is a really important opportunity for them. If you look at um, Australian emissions, <coughs> it's clear that about a third of the sector, or actually all our emissions, come from the power industry, from actually generating electricity. A bit more comes from state, or actually less from stationary industry, and then transport, agriculture, and waste. You would issue shares to, um, for electricity straight through to the utilities and for stationary industry to all of the factories involved in, in actually emitting things that come straight out of their factories. Transport is a little bit more tricky because it involves both trucks and things like that, but also cars. I think it's best if state governments and local governments hold shares on behalf of those industries and then sell the permits and back up into the, the systems that supply um, fuel to them. Agriculture and waste, um, is a very, very difficult issue. It might not be possible in the early stages to even include them in a trading regime. The state of the art, though, would suggest that you would set aside shares for them so th and then put in place regulations and try and encourage industry to get involved in it. We could spend a lot of time talking about ways to improve that. But you would f phase in these sectors. Now let's turn to South Australia. <coughs> 
and very quickly what it would look like. South Australian emissions are much like, like Australia's emissions. We're not finding it too hard to stabilise. In fact, emissions are starting to come down. If we put in a climate sharing system and distribute them initially shares to industry, there'd be financial rewards for innovation and the greatest incentive would go to the greatest emitters. The community um, return could be shared and very quickly we would see vibrant markets for shares and permits and you would achieve the lock-in that I've talked about. I think these are all fundamental things that come out of a transformational reform. In the closing bit of this talk, I want to explore very quickly what it would mean if South Australia went for what's known in the economic literature as first mover advantage. This is really the question, would this state contemplate going ahead of everybody else? Politically, there's an opportunity to do that because we have a Labor government and people here in South Australia who are interested in continuing to lead as we already are in things like wind farms and solar panel systems. We have an opportunity to continue. If we did go first, we would end up with a system where, which fits South Australia and other states down the track, would be forced to accommodate. If we had something up and running, they wouldn't be able to tear it to bits especially if it was set up in perpetuity as shares. We would have a global demonstration of a state-of-the-art system. It would be a new business and people would be coming to, Australia, to South Australia to see how it's working because we'd be taking a different approach. Rather than the standard approach, we'd be saying issue climate shares, recognise that the world is in fact trying to design a sharing system and having something that works locally in the same framework as the global one I think is a powerful model. Climate sharing could be big business for us. We could become the climate sharing hub of the world. It would be an interesting place to be. Known for innovation, we'd have a reputation of being climate responsible and we'd be doing something quite differently. And we'd have administrative capacity and a capacity to take very simple ideas to the rest of the world, supply them with the accounting software and everything needed to do it. And we would be experiencing growth that builds on our natural advantage. Our natural advantage is something um, which is really important. And we would need in doing this to support a local business, to support a local government. And if we think about this and start smallly with a fairly weak limit at the early stages, then we'd be ready when the world moves to setting a binding target and, set, and Australia turns around to ramp up that with businesses ready and structured to invest. I think this is really worth thinking about. It comes out of the experience of being asked to think in Harvard about transformational reforms and looking for something that's different. And the thing that stood and hit me actually between the eyes when sitting down working through this was that if this works in water and it works in fisheries, two things that this state and this nation has done incredibly well, why wouldn't you do exactly the same thing in something like climate, which is arguably much more important to the future world than water or fisheries? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was an inspiring uh, address and I think there'll be a lot of questions and thoughts about that. Uh, we now have about 10 minutes for questions, so if there's any questions, I think we've got a roaming mic. So please, just uh, take the mic, maybe uh, introduce yourself and we'll hand over to Mike. Uh, my name's Nicholas Newland. Um, thanks for the talk, Mark. The thing that comes through strongly to me and I suspect to you is how do you get the debate going about something like this outside the university system within government so that something can actually start to gather momentum? And you talked earlier on about investment entrepreneurs and it seems to me that something like this needs somebody out there to, to sell the argument, to sell the discussion, to get the debate going. And, and unless until that happens, it seems difficult to me as to how you get over that next step. Um, yes, I think there's an S on it. It's not just one person, it's lots of people 
starting to talk about it and working particularly as I've tried to suggest on the simple, simple short little story of how you do it. The ugly part about something like dealing with, with climate change is it is a very complex topic. Um, the idea I'm playing around at the moment is talking about climate sharing and just having a sharing system and if you have a really good robust sharing system then that's the way forward and it could create lots of opportunity for business and communities as well and it's why in the design that I'm playing around with in the very early phase one of this I think it's very important to have something that returns back to local government because you need to have local ownership of this solution as well as state and federal ownership and global ownership but finding the resources necessary to do this is really tricky. I think one of the problems that universities have is that the incentive system for academics is to write papers and to publish in learned journals. It's much less to engage in the sorts of discussions that are involved here. When I was involved in water reform in Australia, um, I was lucky to have a grant through CSIRO which enabled me to um, spend weeks and weeks driving throughout all of the Murray-Darling Basin. It's a very rare opportunity and governments are very reluctant to fund entrepreneurs who go out and just engage continuously unless they're tightly controlled. The experience we've had in looking at transformational reforms around the world in virtually all cases, there's been somebody out there as a bit of a loose cannon, sometimes saying the wrong thing, sometimes explaining it not quite the way a government would like it to be explained. But that builds confidence and trust in it. When things are explained lots of different ways and they keep on coming to the same conclusion, then the community begins to trust. The trust comes from having different ways of explaining it and what tends to happen in a lot of the reforms that... I see fall over is that the arguments are always presented in exactly the same way and that takes the rigour out of testing. What you really need is a process which argues from saying pollution is really bad, this is a way to fix it, to so someone saying look innovation is really important so they start with industry and go this way. Others say look, look it's an equity argument or it's a law, legal argument. When it's argued in multiple ways then that builds the confidence that's necessary to start a transformational journey. And transformational journeys also in the early stages often go quite wrong because reforms have not been done and people don't understand the detail and surprises come up time and time again. But that's part of innovation. When you let things go, you get that innovation that creates the wealth and solves the problem at much less cost than people ever thought would happen. Uh, Gary Newsom, as, so my question comes from the fact that I've lived both in the US and in New Zealand as well as in Australia. So I was wondering what lessons you brought back from your year in the US that particularly informed you on this and similarly whether there's anything you'd take from the New Zealand experience again and apply to this over and above what you'd learned in Australia. Um, the biggest mistake that actually New Zealand made in setting up its fisheries system, which cost it millions, um, was to issue quotas, first of all, in terms of just quantities of tonnes of fish that could be taken. And this was done by doing, getting the best scientists around to work out what the sustainable yield was and saying that's all right and setting it. The fish didn't agree and a whole pile of fisheries started to decline. Um, so reluctantly and at great expense, they moved to shares. It's probably the, the biggest um, mistake that was made. The one which has intrigued me most um, was to see when the early stages of this all being set up, the Maori people were um, very opposed to going to a market-based system. But ultimately they negotiated a share of one of the processing factories. And now they're 
find they own 50% of all the shares and they're trying to have the 50% limit on ownership removed because they've been so successful in something they were totally opposed to. And time and time again, and when you look at transformational reforms that have been really well designed, the thing that stands out, and this comes from a really good example in New Zealand, is that often the people who are most opposed to the reform end up doing best out of it. And the reason for that is they're so trapped in their old system they can't imagine anything else. But forced into the new system and forced to think about it, they're the ones that come out as the real winners. In climate, I would argue that would be a fantastic outcome if the people who were seen as the world's biggest polluters ended up being the most successful under a new climate regime that looked after the future of this world. In terms of um, United States experience, the thing that horrifies me most is the cost of the legal reforms that go on and building systems that can change and adapt as fast as nature changes and adapts is critically important. And we often forget about that. And the, I think this is a real ch challenge for legal systems to find a way to adapt and change really quickly. And the law has a lot of important roles to play in society, but whenever you want to argue over something, the transaction costs can be very high, both in terms of the cost of the lawyers but when it comes to the environment in terms of the delays from making the reforms that often need to be made in weeks, not in years. Other questions? Yeah, hi Mike, Kurt Schwabe. Um, in your time in the US, were you able to gain uh, any experience or insight on California's experience with its AB 32, basically you know, its climate change action plan? Uh, particularly with respect to it being a first mover in the United States, uh, the role of business, I think, appreciating this idea of maybe moving down its learning curve and going back to the loose cannon. We had a, a governor named Schwarzenegger who was able to try to get people to, or at least the Republican Party, to buy into it. Um, yes, it really stands out. By moving first, which they have done in California in this big issue, um, <coughs> they have gained a lot in terms of industries coming in to the Western United States. And that's very, very clear and it stands out. I don't think the scheme they've set up is the right one. I think the one I'm talking about is a much smarter, much more enduring one, which is, has got the frameworks to give the long-term in, um, incentives. But California has really gained by being first and going out and saying, we're going to do this. The difference between top-down imposed reform, as Australia is trying to do now with subsidies and grants and things that are selective and having people at the top trying to work out what's the best thing to do and having industry empowered collectively to act is really important. And when you look into the innovation research, you often find that it's not so much the big research breakthroughs, but it's fine-tuning everywhere, which produces around about half the gains. The research and the big new transformational bits in technology is really important. But once you take over the new technology, there's a lot of adjustment that occurs, and most of that's worked out if there's a bottom-up incentive. And that's really important. So mixing, which is California's now doing, the top-down vision, which can still be giving grants and subsidies to things you think are the right way to go, and coupling that up with incentives to um, profit by, by actually trying and testing things is really powerful, and that really stands out from California. So time for maybe one last question. G'day. Hey Mike, it's Charlie, good to have you Hi back. Hi Charlie, I can hardly see you through the lights. Yeah. Um, I'm from the ECIC on campus, our Entrepreneurship Centre, and focus on sustainable development. And um, the transformational work that you explain, I mean there's so much there that I think is going to provide a framework for us to, to, to really do some amazing work here on campus and within the state. And I have to apologise and ask a, a bit of a stupid question. Um, I, I didn't quite get my head around the mechanism of climate sharing. Could you just give me what, what's the yeah. basic 
how does the shares work? The basic idea with, and that's actually my fault, if I haven't explained that well, then I, I'm sure it's a lot of other people who quite haven't understood it. Think of the rights to emit in all of Australia, it's just like a corporation. Yeah. And you have a very simple rule, if somebody wants to have a right to emit more, then somebody else has to agree to emit less. That's the way these systems work. That's the way corporations really work. So what you do is you issue shares in those allocations as they're made through time. And the rule is simple, that whenever we decide to allow some more emissions, the emissions are allocated in proportion to the number of shares people hold. And that's it. So the, so the only people who receive permits to emit are shareholders. In the early stages of the regime I'm talking about, you'd start off with all of the current polluters. So they would get shares in proportion to what they've been doing in the past. So there's no pain for anybody. But if they can find a way to be more efficient, then they can sell those to somebody else. Right, okay. If you introduce a return to the community, then every year 2% of everybody's shares are sold. Now, who's going to buy those shares? Would you buy